Yeah. Okay. So hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us. My name is Stephanie Yaman, and I'm the co-director research for the Center for Aging and Community. I'm an associate professor in the School of Counseling, Psychotherapy, and Spirituality at St. Paul University. And we're going to begin with a territorial acknowledgement. Okay. Kwe Kakina, hello everyone. Pija Shig, welcome. We would like to acknowledge that St. Paul University is located on the traditional unceded territory of the Anishinaabe um, people. We would like to honor the Anishinaabe, the first peoples of the lands and waters of Kichisidi from the immemorial. We acknowledge that the site of the city of Ottawa serves as the home um, of the Anishinaabe as a place of spiritual ceremonies, cultural gatherings, and exchanges amongst First Peoples. Today, this spirit of peace and friendship is the foundation of relationships amongst Indigenous people and non-Indigenous people from around the globe. On, beh on behalf of the Centre of Aging and Community, I'm happy to welcome you to this presentation from one of our latest winners of the Thomas G. Feeney Award, Luc Lucia Dorvac. A few reminders before we get started though. Um, as you may have noticed, this conversation today will be recorded and it will be added to the university YouTube channel. We will be sending out the link after the event. We invite you to keep your web webcam open. Do not hesitate to send your questions and or reflections throughout the conversation using the chat. We have some time for questions and answers following the presentation by Lucia. Okay. The Center for Aging and Community was created with a mandate to promote healthy aging through the optimization of quality of life and community resources. We aim to fulfill this mandate through innovative, collaborative, and interdisciplinary research and on community engagement to raise awareness and create a space for meaningful dialogue on the important issue such as social isolation spiritual uh, reminiscence with older adults. The community engagement work of the center benefits from the leadership of Patricia Marsden Dole, the co-director of the center. I'm going to invite Patricia to share with us some more information about the Thomas J. Feeney Award and how it supports important research in the field of aging and community. Patricia? Patricia, you're on mute. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Yes, um, I'm Patricia Marsden Dole, and I am a graduate uh, from um, St. Paul University, where I did um, a doctorate in uh, practical theology. Um, and at that time, became very aware of the needs, the social and spiritual needs of our growing aging population. Um, I and there. The award comes from a gift that was offered to the university um, by a private donor and uh, who was interested in this issue because himself and his family are aging. Um, the award was called, named after his father-in-law, Thomas uh, Gerald Feeney, who was the Dean of Common Law at uh, Ottawa U and um, later um, also studied canon law when he retired, studied canon law at St. Paul University. So the two parts of his life came together just as I think they have from somebody like myself who went to university after I retired. Um, and as um, Stephanie mentioned, the intention of the center is to initiate and support community engagement that is responsible, responsive to the challenges and opportunities of an aging society, which as you know, um, with, from recent uh, releases from Stats Canada, the numbers are quite amazing, uh, the increase in the population. So it is very important for all of us to begin to work out how is our society going to function with this large aging population and um, some of the resource constraints that we have uh, 
expect uh, and, and expectations uh, we have for what the community can do for neighbors who are aging. So back to you, uh, Stephanie, and um, on with the show. Thank you. Okay, so before I leave it to Lucia, I'm going to just start by um, introducing her. So Lucia Dorvac is in the Masters of Counseling, Psychotherapy, and Spirituality. She's currently completing her master's thesis on the experiences of informal caregivers of persons with dementia during the pandemic. Um, her supervisor is myself. The type of research that we focus on um, is topics related to caregiving, dementia, and mobility, such as driving. At this point, I'm going to invite her to um, share her wonderful research um, so that you can see the type of work that she has done in the last year. Lucia? Thank you very much for that lovely introduction. Um, I want to start out by saying thank you so much for being here with me today and giving me the opportunity to present my research. Um, so I hope, like me, you've got a cup of tea, some coffee, or a little snack, and we can kind of just um, go through this research and uh, I can answer any questions that you might have. Um, I also want to take a moment to thank the Centre uh, for this award and the opportunity. And I'd also like to thank Gabrielle uh, because she's been so lovely in supporting uh, the logistics of this all. So without further ado, uh, we'll start with the presentation. All right. So as mentioned before, um, my research is on the experiences of informal caregivers of persons with dementia throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. And specifically, we're exploring the impact of COVID-19 stress on caregiver quality of life and well-being. So we've got to start with the basics. Uh, what is dementia? So it's an overall term for a set of symptoms that are caused by disorders affecting the brain. And these symptoms cause changes in memory and or thinking skills that are severe enough to impair a person's daily functioning. Persons with dementia often live with comorbidities. So that you, means that they might have a secondary or additional disease or disorder. And uh, often these comorbidities are undiagnosed. So what constitutes informal caregiving? So in this context, it refers to unpaid voluntary care or support for a person who is in need of it due to physical, cognitive, or mental conditions that is made possible by individuals who are usually either a family member, friend, and or a neighbor. And data suggests that in Canada alone, 70 to 90% of care at home for the elderly is provided in an informal context through these caring and personal relationships. Lucy, Jeff, I just want yeah. to let you know, we're not seeing the full presentation, just the original oh. PowerPoint document. The original? Like uh, like the editing place. So instead of seeing the presentation as a slideshow. Oh, all right. Let me see. Yeah. Sorry, I, just before you got too Thank far. Thank you. I appreciate that. Let's see. Let's see what's going on. Hmm. There you go, you got it. My apologies Sorry. for that. Okay, so let's continue. Um, let's talk about informal caregivers of persons with dementia. So they're required to perform physically, emotionally, socially, and financially intensive tasks alongside a wide ranging list of complex nursing and clinical care tasks, which include numerous activities of daily living um, that are instrumental or basic in nature, and there's a list here, you can see what some of them are. So that could be dressing, bathing, doing laundry, housekeeping, and the list goes on. And often with high dependence. So some additional caregiving challenges. Um, the literature suggests that older adults with dementia are more susceptible to a variety of behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia due to cognitive impairment. 
So that could mean agitation, aggression, uh, depression, apathy showing up, as well as in certain cases, psychosis and mania. So managing these symptoms has its own set of challenges um, based on medication sometimes having an adverse impact on many older adults. And there's limited community resources that employ non-pharmacologic interventions. So why do informal caregivers of persons with dementia need our attention? I think based on the previous slides we can see, but even the literature is saying that they're faced with high care demands, which pose substantial physical and emotional risks for them. And studies report that they experience increased exacerbation of care-related stress compared to non-dementia caregivers. And it's usually characterized by an intensification of the role due to the condition and increased feelings of captivity in their role and their needs are often overlooked. And due to the intense demands of their roles, this increases the likelihood of them becoming vulnerable patients themselves. There's also some other considerations, as Patricia mentioned before, the aging population is growing and there's also a significant increase of persons with dementia projected globally in decades to come. Informal caregiver contributions notably facilitate the sustainability of formal care systems. With their economic contribution in Canada alone estimated at $25 billion per year. So let's talk a bit, a bit about the COVID-19 pandemic. So it's been recognized as a geriatric emergency. It's widely regarded as a phenomenon of isolation with several increased stresses within the gl general global population. Overall, Canadian populations are currently facing declining mental health and coping skills as a result of the pandemic. Individuals who are already exposed to health, social and or structural inequities pre-pandemic are at higher risk for deterioration of mental and emotional health. There are also studies that have said that symptoms have intensified due to the prolonged isolation of quarantine measures and that it can be observed through symptoms of post-traumatic stress, anxiety, and anger related to the pandemic. So let's talk a bit about what COVID stress is. So um, COVID stress was uh, developed initially through Canadian stu uh, studies done by Taylor and colleagues. Um, and COVID stress syndrome in their study and their measure is characterized by five related facets. So these facets look at danger and contamination fears, socioeconomic concerns, xenophobia, traumatic stress, and compulsive checking and reassurance seeking. It's said that people with more severe COVID stress syndrome are more likely to be anxious or depressed, stockpile supplies, experience distress uh, throughout voluntary self-isolation and avoid public places or transportation. So that could, yeah, the, the uh, chart here just demonstrates um, some of the uh, factors that we're looking at within the measure and also the associations there. So how could COVID stress specifically be impacting informal caregivers of persons with dementia? So they've historically experienced a multitude of challenges in their role, which only became further compounded by the pandemic. So let's think about lockdowns and limited access, loss of critical supports and programs. So we're looking at PSWs, respite, day programs, family and friends who were visitors previously. What about implementing public health measures like social distancing, lockdown, and masks uh, for a caregiver whose care recipient may experience challenges in comprehending, executing, and recalling them due to cognitive decline? There's also basic activities of daily living that we looked at before that pose a direct challenge to realistically being able to implement many physical distancing protocols. That could leave a caregiver uh, in uh, worried about transmitting the virus to their care recipient. Studies have also so showed that there, a link has been evidenced between the evolution of behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia in persons with dementia throughout the pandemic and its consequences of poor mental health on their caregivers. So we came in with a research question. Does an association exist between COVID-19 stress and both quality of life and well being in caregivers of persons with dementia. 
we hypothesized a negative correlation would exist between COVID-19 stress and both quality of life and well-being. And what this means is we think that when COVID stress increases, a caregiver's quality of, well, uh, quality of life and well-being will decrease. So let's talk a bit about our study. We had 20 Canadian participants recruited for an online survey between December 2021 and April 2022. The majority of participants we recruited were actually from the database at the Bruyere Research Institute. Our participants had certain criteria that they needed to meet, so they needed to be a primary informal unpaid caregiver for at least two years. Uh, some other criteria was that their care recipient met the qualifications for an official diagnosis of some form of dementia, and they were dependent on support from their caregiver for activities and tasks related to daily living. We also wanted to ensure that uh, our participants provided at least 10 hours of direct contact care per week. We decided to take a mixed method approach. And what that means is basically we, were, uh, we had quantitative and qualitative components uh, to our online survey. The quantitative portion used scientifically validated scales to measure COVID stress, quality of life, burden, and role captivity. The qualitative portion was a short series of open-ended questions to gather some deeper information on the experiences of informal caregivers throughout the pandemic. And the results. So here are some descriptive statistics about our study. 50% um, of participants identified as the husband or wife of the person with dementia. A majority of the caregivers we surveyed were between the ages of 50 and 78. 70% of these caregivers identified as female. 80% of all participants currently live with their care recipient. This suggests that it may be more challenging for a caregiver to find time for themselves and their individual needs. 65% of all participants reported providing more than 20 hours of care weekly with 40% of all participants reporting 50 plus hours of weekly care. 80% of all participants have been a primary caregiver between two to five years. So that also suggested that they were relatively new to the role. So what is the quantitative data saying about how caregivers are doing throughout the pandemic? 65% of our participants scored in the moderate to severe burden category. 70% of participants scored within the range of moderate and high care responsibilities with some or very few of their own needs being met. 35% of participant, participants identified with their caring tasks and responsibilities taking up most of their energy. 45% particip of participants identified within the range of somewhat to very much when asked about role captivity and only 50% identified as feeling considerably supported in their role. So in terms of statistical findings and what was highly significant, uh, we did find some correlations. Um, so in terms of quality in life and burden, the correlation coefficient was uh, 0.864, and that indicates a highly significant correlation. What this implies is that when individuals scored higher totals on our quality of life scale, which indicated poor quality of life, they tended to score higher totals on the burden scale, which indicated higher burden. In terms of burden and role captivity, the correlation coefficient was negative 0.666, which was another highly significant correlation. This implies that when individuals scored higher totals on our burden scale, which indicated higher burden, they tended to score lower totals on the role captivity scale, which indicated higher role captivity. Quality of life and role captivity also had a correlation coefficient of negative 0.790, another highly significant correlation. This implies that when individuals scored higher totals on our quality of life scale, 
which indicated poor quality of life, they tended to score lower totals on the role captivity scale, which indicated higher role captivity. So from these three, we can see that we noticed trends that when there were poor quality of life, there was higher burden. When there was higher burden, there was higher role captivity. When there was poor quality of life, there tended to be higher role captivity. In terms of our study, does COVID stress correlate with quality of life and well-being? Statistical interpretation of our data does not seem to point to a correlation, though as seen in the previous slide, we found correlations between quality of life and burden, burden and role captivity, quality of life and role captivity. However, some of our qualitative data may be saying something else. So here are some excerpts from open-ended questions that we asked our participants. The first question was, what changes in caregiver-related supports did you experience throughout the pandemic? So our first participant is saying they couldn't afford necessities. Accessing healthcare was indeed harder. They even say it was sheer luck and God's grace we survived. Another participant said support became virtual and that placed uh, more burden on their effort and time. It didn't allow for respite time that would be normal with day programs. Another participant says that the helper that they used to have come in the afternoon once a week um, had to cancel due to lockdowns and COVID concerns. So she used to have an activity set up for her husband and for the most part it was canceled. So changes in routines and supports. Another participant uh, spoke about PSWs being stopped for a while at the day programs, and that made her father feel quite isolated and depressed. We have another comment, more isolated. And uh, a participant also just saying they missed the in-person support that they received from the Dementia Society. Our next question was, describe how personally seen and understood you felt by local and nationwide policymakers regarding relief provided to caregivers throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. So not seen or understood, home care has been ignored. Uh, this individual also says that they don't think that the government is in a hurry to spend any money on this. Another participant says, I don't see any understanding of the things I deal with or the real isolation that has been the norm for the past two years. I don't feel caregivers are supported locally or nationally, was what another participant said. I don't feel seen at all. Um, also expressing how they feel like they're being taken advantage of as a family caregiver because they won't receive any outside help until they fully break down because they're saving these healthcare systems a lot of money. Um, they go on to say, more people who require caregivers are staying in their homes until something desperate requires them to move to a nursing home or assisted living. Another participant speaks about limited support being available in the community and that um, post, post lockdown, uh, they've not returned to previous levels as pre-pandemic. We also have a comment about early onset Alzheimer's spouses who have to balance working and caregiving. Um, little support is available for them and caregivers really have to source available resources. So we're hearing that there's a lot of work to be done to even just find the help. And this individual is expressing during the pandemic, I definitely felt more isolated with a lot less resources. I felt very alone and trapped. Our next question was, how hopeful do you feel about the well-being of your future as a caregiver in light of the COVID-19 pandemic? And what are some of the greatest challenges you face at the moment in regards to caregiving throughout the pandemic? We have an individual saying, I'm just trying to balance a full-time job, stretch my money. They speak about thousands of dollars um, on a month uh, with transportation expenses to assist a family member. And they're just hoping things don't get worse as restrictions start lifting. There's also worries about other health being in, uh, impacted uh, as a ripple effect of lockdown and the pandemic. 
We have another participant saying that they're not very helpful. Uh, they're not very hopeful that their caregiving burden is going to ease. They also have some worries about closures coming up. They also can't see there being an, any significant respite time available for a while. And then they also bring attention to the fact that long-term care wait lists are years long. And they acknowledge that as burnout approaches, the quality of care diminishes. We also have a comment that serious help only comes when there is a complete breakdown or crisis. So that there's a certain point that has to be crossed and, and sometimes that point is too late. Another participant uh, says that they're a person living with Parkinson's disease and um, they're the care recipient as well as um, a caregiver. So that dyad, they're both working as each other's uh, caregiver and they're both care recipients and, and dealing with their own challenges. We also have a comment about somebody dealing with depression and anxiety and saying that they've given their all and they're now physically and mentally depleted. So continued, um, we have a participant who shared that they were lucky in that their husband was hit by a car. With the settlement he received, he was able to afford to pay for the extra care and assistance. And then we're also hearing worry that, you know, this caregiver is aware that care requirements will only increase from there and that they have to be frugal with the funds that they received in that case. Um, the caregiver also speaks about their care partner being isolated and that it's affected uh, his physical well-being. Um, and things that have affected the caregiver emotionally, which, um, you know, they state have caused their care recipient to be unhappy. Then there are also some concerns for individuals who remain in fairly good health, but worry if their situation would change, uh, how that would impact the caregiving role. We also have another participant who speaks about worries about um, their care recipient catching the virus through them, and also concerns for their uh, care recipient um, experiencing challenges with mental health and feeling isolated. We have another comment about this disease already isolates caregivers even without a pandemic. And um, another individual who says that they're just hanging on with the help of faith, their family and community. So lastly, we asked what types of changes would you personally like to see implemented to better support you in your caregiving role throughout the pandemic? So we're seeing a lot of need for additional support and hands to help me caregiver support. We also have some co comments about long-term care facilities needing a total, total overhaul um, and different strategies. Home care needing more funding, as well as dementia trained PSWs um, and more care hours and affordable care homes for dementia patients. We have an individual who talks about assessments that try to understand the real needs of caregivers. So perhaps um, continuing research more in depth to truly understand the needs of this population. We also see uh, respite, social programming and support and funding for this type of care through the government. There's comments also about more in-home care and also stating somebody trustworthy so that this participant can get out into the community. They also uh, shed light on how long it takes to do paperwork uh, if her husband is placed in assisted living for respite care. And um, she wonders about what would happen if she had an emergency and needed to place him very quickly. And lastly, this individual says, I want to get away to rejuvenate myself. So there's also this need for some self-care uh, within the role. We have an individual that is saying that programs feel stressed to the limit at this time. So any support right now seems near non-existent. Um, another individual is talking about more days in a day program. Um, to really help her, the father um, counteract his boredom and isolation. And another comment, more funding for in-home help and more day programs. And uh, younger families needing support. 
um, so that they don't bankrupt themselves when placing a loved one in long-term care, particularly with early onset dementia. Um, this individual states, finally, I see the whole system is very confusing and overlapping. It's a lot to navigate and uh, more support at home. So here are some general themes that we've seen through some of those quotes. We've seen some grief, a sense of loss about how life was, how support was before. People feeling unheard and unsupported. There's depression, there's anxiety, uh, feeling of invisibility and isolation, to name a few themes. So knowing what we know through this information, what could this imply about our quantitative data? So here are some possibilities. It could be possible that there is no correlation between COVID stress and quality of life and well-being. However, current literature does seem to point to a correlation. Another possibility is the measure used for COVID stress may be too general and does not accurately capture the nuances within the dementia caregiver experience throughout the pandemic. This may point to a need for dementia caregiver specific skills to be developed to measure COVID stress. Something similar was done with the quality of life scales and there was a quality of life scale uh, developed specifically for dementia caregivers to capture these nuances. There could also be challenges with self-reporting on a scale if participants consider current experiences primarily through a post lockdown lens perceiving current experiences much more positively when compared with the intensity of previous waves. So we have to keep in mind, our survey was live in a period when there was no lockdown, then a lockdown, and then no lockdown, with the last point of lockdown being a period where restrictions loosened quite a bit and certain mandates were dropped. It could also be possible that there are some limitations with participant diversity and or sample size. So recruiting throughout a pandemic had its challenges for sure, despite help that we received from a large credible institution, which was Berea, and our best efforts. What we can say for sure is the pandemic has had an adverse impact on informal caregivers of people with dementia, and they are currently experiencing challenges in areas of their quality of life and well-being. Though we cannot yet confirm whether this is related directly to COVID-19 stress. But please keep in mind, we are currently still in the process of analyzing and interpreting our data. So stay tuned for my thesis. That was a bit of a shameless plug. So from a clinical lens, what is the impact and implication of understanding the experience of informal caregivers throughout the COVID-19 pandemic? So first and foremost, what we want to do is document the current challenges that the, this population is experiencing so that we can continue critical research that could improve mental and emotional health outcomes. It's also an opportunity to raise awareness of these experiences to better inform clinical work with this population, particularly with conceptualization, clinical interventions, and resource referrals. More tentatively, uh, to advocate for the needs of this population, inform policy making, and increase access to and development of free, affordable therapeutic support support groups for informal caregivers of persons with dementia. So, simply put, promoting their well-being, health, and quality of life should be a public health priority. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Lucia, for that beautiful presentation. Um, at this point, I'm going to invite um, everyone who uh, might have a question to either raise their hand um, by using the, um, the raise hand um, button uh, at the bottom of your Zoom, or to simply write your question in the chat. And um, I will... Um, I will be able to uh, read those for everyone, okay? So we'll go ahead and start the uh, question and answer period. If you have any questions, either the chat or raise your hand. Um, so I'll look through the chat to see if there's any questions. Um, so 
Um, we have one question saying, is it possible to get a PDF copy of the presentation? Um, Lucia, would you be comfortable with that? I definitely yes. would. Would it be okay if it was in PowerPoint or PDF specific, Julie? That's totally up to you. Okay. Um, if you want people to be able to change things, <laughs> yes. then I would recommend that you send it in PDF. Okay. And uh, if you want to directly message me just privately here through the chat, you can send me your email. Great. Thanks a lot. Appreciate You're it. You're welcome. I actually had a question. Um, I was wondering if you could say more about what does role captivity mean? Um, mm -hmm you had a skill on that, but I'm not sure uh, exactly what that entails. Yeah. So role captivity is um, pretty much as a caregiver, their, their feeling of being perhaps stuck or not having uh, any break from their role. So this could cause a lot of mental, emotional, even physical distress. So our role captivity uh, captures certain questions just to see how captive these individuals felt in their caregiving role. Did they have somebody else that could assist them? Um, do they have those day away programs where, you know, if they need an afternoon to themselves or they need some time for their own self-care or just to catch up with their own lives and activities? Is that okay? Excellent. Any other questions? Patricia? I'd just like to ask uh, Zija if uh, anything has been done about educating the general public about the um, dementia wave that's going to come with this aging population, because it's going to have to go beyond publicly financed resources into community um, awareness mm -hmm. and education then you know response how to respond to this that's a really good question um i think that there is always more work that can be done with that so i do feel that within uh particular communities where aging is at the forefront um and community there's perhaps a little more uh there are more conversations happening around this theme but i think there could definitely be more uh, within these communities and particularly um, relevant to the field that I'm in, uh, I would like to see that expanded here. So for people coming out of this program and starting their clinical work, that they're understanding the challenges of this population. So there's always more work to be done with that. Mm -hmm. The literature is speaking about this quite a bit. Uh -huh. I'm not seeing it as much in very general settings. Um, so I believe that's something we can definitely work on a bit more just as a society. Well, that's right. And I'm looking at um, so many of the condo buildings um, have large aging populations in them. So it would be important that the community living in the condos um, understands who is having problems because they can see problems, but how to intervene in a, in a nice way, mm -hmm. both for the caregivers and for the person with dementia. Totally. Ruth? Yes. Uh, I thank, thank you, Lucia. That was an excellent uh, presentation. I'm mm -hmm. glad I'm here. Um, as, as someone who uh, I've been studying at St. Paul and working on my Master of Divinity and, and looking to volunteer in my community, I'm rural and live about an hour south of Ottawa. And we are very much a retirement aging demographic here. Mm -hmm. um, my daughter recently just started to work for a local agency and and there uh, she's doing a contract a maternity contract where they actually provide some of these day program um, resources and relief for the families like so that you know the uh, person with dementia has a place to go for four or five hours and what can be done and I've recently um, gone through the process to become a volunteer there myself yeah. help with meals on wheels and those types of things but, but a kind of following up with what Patricia said, how do we in the community who have maybe experienced it personally, and how do we get that education out there generally to the public? Um, you know, people, 
uh, there's biases and, you know, kind of what we come to, what we think of seniors and aging and, mm -hmm. but it, things are definitely changing. And it's like, how can we be advocates and allies, I guess, for that um, in maybe a, like a, going back to school, learning the importance of academic work that gives it to us now, now bring it down to me at my level. So I will sort of mm -hmm. know what to do, uh, feet and boots on the ground kind of thing and make it, it easy because, and make us aware, because I think people want to help. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but there, there are also so many needs in our world, but this one we definitely see the need to be caring for those in and such a variety of you know the early onset uh the the different stages of that so yeah, yeah. not sure if there's really a question there but, there know. was I okay. love that first of all I just I love that reflection even in the question and I think that's a really big question so I can't provide this um you know perfect ribbon answer on top of it but I do think when we're dealing you know, with these communities, and you were talking, there could be stigma, uh, there could not be awareness. I think it's really important in the work that we do. So in academia, in clinical work, we need to really meet the people, we need to really form those relationships. I think that's the foundation. In the work that we do, the therapeutic work, um, we refer to the alliance, so working with clients and building that. So if we're just studying this population, we don't want to meet them, we don't want to know their stories, we, that's not going to be helpful. So I think strength in community, and it was mentioned earlier before we started the presentation, like community and getting to know each other, that is really important. So it's not necessarily this perfect answer that can solve that problem. But I volunteer myself at the mission. Um, I've been a little less frequent these days because I'm doing a thesis, but there's lots of different community there. So even the clients that we're serving uh, are within this population sometimes as well, and some of the volunteers. And I just find that really bringing this into an everyday context is just meeting people getting to know them, getting to know how we can help them. And also, as you said, there are so many needs in the world. So also understanding that one person alone cannot do everything, but there's this little part that we can do to meet people where they're at. Thank you very much. Yeah, and I would just like to follow on from that because it really is up this line of the community and the university working together. Um, that um, this is a big, it's a big issue that's coming and it really is. And I appreciate that the work that you're doing with Zija, if you could just keep moving it forward so that um, we can start publicizing in some way the importance of the public being engaged in a relational sense with both caregivers and those suffering from dementia. This is a large community issue. And so I appreciate the fact that you're working on it. Excellent questions and comments. Um, Maggie, I see that you have a question, your hand up. Yes, uh, thanks very much for the presentation. And uh, I, I have, a uh, question in my mind is that uh, um, are there any kind of organizations for these uh, informal caregivers? Because I, I think that uh, there's always a problem about uh, insufficient resources and there's always a need for, for any people for uh, any service sector. But just I'm thinking the first thing is that uh, in the long run, maybe this group of caregivers they need some people or to help them to build up a kind of network that they can have the kind of mutual support. And uh, because um, we, we know that researchers, they, they go on and on and on, <laughs> but sometimes that their, their real needs, maybe they need to be taken care of for one another. Mm -hmm. And another point is that um, apart from the policy level changes, um, can we do something at a more micro level or more at an individual or neighborhood level mm -hmm. that can help them uh, for some immediate needs or some kind of a spiritual support or just some people are making a call to them mm -hmm. and it cannot make a, a big change, 
but maybe I think that um, this kind of um, really personal and spiritual support is not very costly in one sense, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, many people, maybe the whole community can get involved, uh, like the, the university students or even the high school students or the housewives, maybe they can mm -hmm. join. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> just a little, little reflection and sharing. Thanks. I love I love those reflections. So much like Ruth's questions, I just appreciate how much richness was in the question itself and um, just some of the attention you're bringing. So I'll start off first. I love your background. We'll just start with that. That's where I want to be right now in a tropical place. Um, but going back to what you had mentioned, there's this is a real need and there are those supports that are um, available through, you know, uh, the government, um, through Ontario and all of that. But we're hearing through our studies that um, these are pretty much plugged up, like the resources right now. Um, if you need a list of those or if you have them, I can definitely look into some of them to to give to you however you you are expressing a really good need about like what do we do with this research once we find out because sometimes research can go on for so long and so long but we don't start practicing it in the everyday we don't start bringing it into our everyday situations and i think what you're talking about is also what um in our research hopefully we're hoping that it goes in a direction where there are there is more awareness of this issue, this issue, this challenge, and also from a clinical lens, as uh, you know, a training psychotherapist myself, that people start to develop these programs, as you're saying, where people can kind of come in a community setting, and have some type of therapeutic. Um, session, either individual, one-on-one, -on -one, or uh, workshops facilitated. And those are things that hopefully, uh, as we continue with this research, once people are more informed of these experiences, they can really start to focus on that, because it sounds like there really is a need for people to come together in a, in a community way, not just services provided you know, from the government, but really people coming together, getting to know their community, uh, getting to know the people that are really impacted by this, not just the condition or the challenge. Thank you. Um, we have another question uh, by Julie. Um, it's not as much a question as um, to continue on what Maggie was saying. Um, I know that um, my association ha began a Nourish for Caregivers support group. Um, I do monthly sessions with 26 individuals who are caregivers. And in, in a big, the big majority of them are those who are dealing with dementia. Um, aging parents or um, you know children that have significant disabilities and um, that environment is one that is so important for them because it's giving them an opportunity to be sharing and to know that they're not alone <clears throat> and um, and I think it's important that we continue to promote those type of programs um, because I'm seeing the results uh, of it with that sharing that is occurring. And unfortunately, because we're in a COVID environment, even though things are loosening, you know, to be able to do that in person versus virtual would be even more impactful. And, uh, but, you know, on the other hand, it's, it's enabling people who live in different communities to be able to gather together and to be sharing. And I think this would be, I think the time is right now um, with the new Department of Seniors and Long-Term Care, with a huge um, consultation process that is um, happening right now through that department, um, I think it's important for us to um, make people realize how, how huge dementia is and that it's only going to get worse. And if we don't, if we don't, you know, populate those those surveys um, with um, the opportunity of expressing the importance of 
of all of these supports that are required for caregivers who are taking care of the, their loved ones with dementia, we may miss the boat. Um, so I'm really, I'm really thankful for the, the, the research that you've done on this and look forward to receiving the PowerPoint presentation. So thank you, Lucia. You're welcome. Thank you so much for that. And would you mind sharing, uh, only if, if that's okay with you, would you mind sharing, like if there's a link to your, your organization or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's um, icam.ca, so I-H-C-A-M dot C-A. Okay. Yeah, and um, yeah, I, I, I have a monthly support uh, group that is the third Monday of every month, so this upcoming Monday is going to be uh, this month's session. So wow. and it really focuses on so many different areas um, that caregivers, caregivers are faced with and mm. need support on. That's amazing. Thank you to you. And hopefully also just uh, everybody else hearing that you may know of now an additional uh, resource or group uh, throughout this time. Yeah. I'm also going to add um, that, you know, um, there are a lot of mental health professionals like myself and the clinical psychologist who work with um, the, this specialized population. So I work particularly with older adults uh, with dementia and with caregivers. Um, I think that as a community, we can help support um, the caregivers that we know um, older adults who've just received a diagnosis in encouraging them and socializing them to the importance of seeking therapy. Um, sometimes, you know, in certain um, populations, it's still taboo. And so just talking about it and being open, right, to, um, you know, how beneficial it can be. Because in this population, what I notice is that, you um, you know, where you get your meaning shifts significantly. And this is a piece that we work on in therapy. Um, your identity can shift, right? If you're a caregiver, how you define yourself um, may shift as well. And, and that can be worked on as well as, you know, uh, there can be significant mental health challenges such as symptoms of depression and anxiety, which of course would also be worked on. Um, so I think as a community, we can support um, others by telling them it's, it's okay to consult. Are there any other questions or comments from the audience? Before we close this off. I'm not seeing any hands, okay. Um, so I really want to be able to take the time right now to thank uh, Lucia, um, everyone who was present here today. I want to invite everyone to connect with um, the um, Center on Aging um, and Community. Um, you have, I think, Gabrielle at the very beginning posted all of our information. So you can go ahead and click those links if you're interested in communicating with us. Our next event, event is in September. Uh, we will be sending out information about that. This will be the presentation of another recipient of the Thomas Feeney Award. Um, and I'm just going to invite Patricia now to uh, say a few words um, before we close off. Thank you very much. And I think you've really opened something up that's going to be a subject for the, um, our Center for Aging and Community over many years to come, uh, because it's only beginning now when the first of the boomers hit 76 or 75 or 76 that the numbers are now going to start coming. And a lot of people in an individualist culture like the one that we've got, um, we're going to be dealing with a lot of people living alone with dementia. So, AJ, you've really opened up something for, I think, for future uh, researchers, which I am going to mention right now, because the, the Thomas G. Feeney Award um, is uh, 
looking for proposals for the November 15th deadline. Um, and the um, application requires um, that, that um, so I should say first that it is a, it's a good sized award is $2,500. There were two a year. And um, we are looking at students on a graduate study. So that means at master's or doctoral level who are conducting original um, research that explores issues related to aging and community, um, such as the one we've opened up today. The, um, what we're looking for, there are four categories of research that have to be done. So the project wants clarity of the proposed goals. It wants a quality and significance of the research. So that means just determining what the research of quality will be. Um, it has to be feasible, appropriateness of timeline and probability, and knowledge translation mobilization. And of course, as you know, that was a very important part of the discussion. In fact, that was much of what was the follow up um, to our uh, presentation today. So again, we're looking at something very practical and very important. Um, so thank you very much. and. Uh, that was a very interesting discussion about something that because I work in the community with a lot of groups and dementia is a very big issue. So it's very important for people who came here to listen to this to keep following this issue and informing themselves as helpers in the community. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. So November 15th, sorry, November 15th for MA and PhD students at St. Paul University. Thank you. Thank you everyone for attending. Please stay in touch with us um, by following the links that Gabrielle has posted for us. We hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Steph. Bye. Thank you, Gabrielle.